Good evening, good morning, good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. In today's study, we are going to explore many topics on salvation that are described in scripture. As with all of our studies, we are going to focus on scriptures canonized and the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as the Hebrew manuscripts of the Gospels and Revelation. We are humbled and excited to share this study with you all. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise your great name. May your spirit move upon us. May your truth be made known and may what we share by those listening, may it move them to confirm and research this topic themselves to see what the scriptures truly say and so that they may know about salvation that comes only from you. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Today's study, we are going to be talking about salvation. And as I go through this, I'll have questions and then we'll go into the scriptures to answer those questions. Are we once saved, always saved? Or we once saved, not always saved? Do we really understand when we are saved and how we are saved? We're going to answer all of these questions. Why or the purpose of salvation? Through who does salvation come? From who salvation comes? From where is salvation? When are we saved? Once saved, not always saved. Conditions of salvation. Faith and works. Can believers fall away? What must we practice? Can believers be thrown into the fire? Can you be punished after you were forgiven? We must become overcomers and prepare for action. Now here I put together some of the Hebrew words that are mentioned when it comes to the term of salvation or delivered and rescued and that Yesha is used quite often. Then we have Yeshua, which is also derived from Yesha, and also Yesha, and also Teshua. Each one of these, in essence, will mean deliverance, rescue, salvation. And then the Greek words that are similar, that are used in the New Testament, if you will, which is soter and soteria, or soterion. And each one of those similar, deliverer, rescuer, salvation. And I just wanted to point all those out. Those are the primary words that are being used when we're discussing this topic. Next, I wanted just to put a little diagram here about works. Are works involved in salvation? And you have three views on this. One view is works never involved. There's no works that are needed in your salvation. And then there's the view of works always involved in your salvation. And then there's another view that there's works involved, and then there's a grace period. And this is more of the dispensational view, where the grace period is once Yeshua came, and until we get to the book of Revelation or into the millennial kingdom, then works are once again in play. So it it just depends on one's view of scriptures. There's usually three views that fit primarily here. Then I want to talk about the qualifiers to salvation. I think this is probably the most important slide to review and look at. Many people will fall in the quadrant of belief. They have belief, they entrust, and they maybe they want to commit to, and so they believe. And we read in John 6, 29, Jesus said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one who God sent. But at this step, we know that even the devils believe. We've seen that in scriptures, and I'll touch on that later. But the devils believe. If the devils believe, then what is belief? Are they saved? And are we saved if we just believe? I think not if the devils believe, and that is it. So then we move to the next quadrant. After there comes belief and understanding, then there's faith. And that word faith, I'll touch on that, but that's fidelity, truthfulness to observance. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Yeshua is telling us to have faith. First, he's telling us to believe in the one who God sent, which is him. And then he's saying, have faith in God. 
he's commanding us to have faith. So it's not just belief, but it's also faith. And that is where the devils or demons lack. That's where they go no further than that. They don't have the faith in God. Now, once you have faith that you believe that you are truthful to observances, what are you observing? We know we're observing his word. And by observing his word, we must prove we're observing his word by some type of action or deed. And that most people know that word maybe as works. And Revelation here, we read in 14, 12, here is the patient endurance of the saints. So here is a qualifier of saints described in Revelation. Those who keep the commandments of God and faith in Yeshua. So this quadrant people are keeping the commands. They're doing these commands that are found in the word of God. So not only do they just believe, but they have faith to observe the laws, the word of God, and they're doing them. By doing them with their faith, they become justified, which in James uses the word justified or perfected. That a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So we can only be complete or justified. And the scriptures also use the term perfected, and it means all the same thing here, by works and not by faith alone. So we must have faith and we must have action upon that faith. And that is how we are complete in salvation. And I did put in here between one and two, belief and faith, there comes repentance. Once you believe, in order to come to faith, you've got to have repentance. And that is where, obviously, the demons and devils do not cross. They don't do. Meditate upon this. Research it out yourself. But I think this might be helpful for you to see how salvation is explained, I think, in a fairly simple way into knowing that you are complete in your salvation. Now, next, let's speak a little bit further. And what I did here is I did color code some of these words so that you can follow along with belief faith works and perfected or justified or complete and i put in there the strong greek numbers for you to check it out yourself and as i said in the same way faith also if it has no works it is dead by itself and this is all in james 2 17 to 24 but someone may well say you have faith and i have works Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So to prove your faith, to show others you have faith, you got to have your works in doing so. And we also read in the scriptures where it talks about a good tree and a bad tree. And it said, you will know them by their fruit. And we know that fruit is your actions. All right, so you believe that Yah is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to acknowledge, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was our father Abraham not justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was completed. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed Yah, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of Yah. That a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now here, Jesus is speaking, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. So Yeshua is telling the people, if I do not do the works of my Father, don't believe me. Basically saying it, I'm a false teacher. I'm, a, I'm false. If, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, don't believe me. But if I am doing them, works. Even if you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. How do people know that Jesus is in the Father by Jesus doing the Father's works? Jesus is telling them to examine his works in the Father, whether or not to believe him. 
And I will use Jesus and Yeshua because of the, the different yes. scriptures that we use and the audience that may be listening. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die forever. Do you believe this? Now, did Jesus say those who believe in him will not die? No. Those who believe in him and those who live in him will never die. We have to read the scriptures in context. Believe and live in him. That is an action. You're living in him. You're doing, as I just explained prior, you got to have the faith, the belief, and the actions proving in him and you will never die. We must always live in him, walk as he walked. There is an actionable requirement. And further, Proverbs 3, 3 on faith and work. I put several translations for you to compare and the Hebrew strongs on the bottom so you can also look at these words and see what they are really saying. And here in the LEB, may loyal love and truth not forsake you, bind them around your neck, write them upon your heart. And then we see, do not let kindness and truth leave you. Let not loving commitment and truth forsake you. Let not loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. We see in this beginning part is kindness, that piety, the good deeds. So there's this actionable part that we take plus the stability, the trustworthiness, the faithfulness. Let it not forsake us. So even in Proverbs, it's telling us that your faithfulness and your actions of good deeds do not forsake them, but put them around your neck, write them on your heart. Okay. So now I'm going to start going into some of these questions here. Why is there salvation? Salvation through who? Salvation from who? Salvation comes from where? And when are we saved? So let's look at the next few slides to answer these questions. Salvation is for what purpose? Yahweh your Elohim, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior speaking. Everyone who is called by my name, and I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Isaiah 43:15. I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Isaiah 46, 13. I bring my righteousness near, it is not far, and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. So the purpose of salvation is for Yah's glory. It's right there. I shared you at least two scriptures that show that the purpose of our salvation is for his glory. Now, salvation is from who? Psalm 62, for the music director on Jeduthun, a psalm of David. Only for God, my soul waits in silence. From him is my salvation. And that word right there, salvation, is Yeshua. Only he is my rock and my Yeshua. My high stronghold, I shall not be greatly shaken. Only for God, wait in silence. O oh, my soul, because my hope is from him. Only he is my rock and my Yeshua. My high stronghold, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my Yesha and my glory. God is my strong rock, my refuge. Trust him at all times, O oh people. Pour out before him your heart. God is a refuge for us. Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said to the people, You must not be afraid. Stand still and see the Yeshua of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today, because the Egyptians whom today you will never see again. Jeremiah three twenty three. Surely an illusion comes from the hills, the turmoil on the mountains. Surely in Yahweh our God is the salvation of Israel. So salvation comes from Yahweh. And we read it, we see it. It comes from Yahweh, it comes from God. 
Further on that, Isaiah 25, He will destroy death forever, and the Lord Yahweh will wipe off the tears from all faces, and he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken, and one will say on that day, Look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he saved us. This is Yahweh. We waited for him. Let us be glad, and let us rejoice in his salvation. Genesis 49, 18. I wait for your salvation, O Yahweh. Micah 7, 7. I will look to Yahweh. I will wait for the God of my salvation. Isaiah 43, 11. I myself am Yahweh, and there is no Savior besides me. Isaiah 45, 17. Israel is saved by Yahweh with everlasting salvation. Salvation comes from Yahweh. Yahweh. But salvation is through who? Matthew 1 20, 21. But as he was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Yeshua because he will deliver his people from their sins. And we see the, in the etymology of Yeshua, the Lord is salvation, in that uh, word, Iesus, that's used in the Greek, which is either translated as Jesus or Joshua. And in Hebrew, it would be Yehoshua or Yeshua. So salvation comes through Yeshua, Jesus, but it comes from Yahweh. If, if you don't quite understand that, think of Yahweh as the king and giving all authority and power to his son, Yeshua, so that salvation comes from Yahweh through Yeshua, if that helps you. All right, so salvation is from where? Where does salvation come from? Psalms 14 and 53. Oh, that from Zion would come salvation for Israel. When Yahweh returns the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be happy. Isaiah 12, 6. Inhabitant of Zion, shout out and sing for joy, for the Holy One of Israel is great in your midst. So we know salvation is coming out or from Zion. As you piece these questions together, that if salvation is coming through Yeshua, coming from Yahweh, and from where? where they are from, from Zion. Now the next question, when are we saved? Matthew 10, 22. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name. This is Yeshua talking. But the one who endures to the end, this one will be saved. So Yeshua himself is telling us that the one who endures to the end, this one will be saved. Now, he didn't say, the one who believes in me, the one who has faith in me, the one who's doing the works, but he's giving us a time frame here, and he's telling us, the one who endures to the end. And I say that because as we continue to look at scriptures, we are going to see the complexity of answering this question. Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end... This person will be saved. The second witness to that first one. Continuing, Revelation 2.10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Here's another qualifier of a time frame of being faithful and believing. We must do it to the end, to death, all the way. Run this race to the end. Mark 13.13. 13, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end, this one will be saved. Okay, so that is a time frame that I want to point out as we'll continue on this topic. But we see at least four or five verses that talk about enduring to the end. Then you will be saved. Then comes your salvation. All right. Now let's look at these questions here. Once saved, not always saved. Salvation has conditions, and what is faith in action? Let's look at these scriptures. Once saved, always saved. 
In this doctrine of once saved, always saved, if a person falls from grace, then they claim that he or she was not saved in the first place. This is what I used to say. This is what I used to believe. Consider 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So even angels can fall from grace. You cannot say a person was not saved prior to falling. So if a person is, quote, saved, then they fall from grace. You cannot say he was not saved prior to falling. Because the angels, were they not saved before they fell? Were they not in the presence of Yah? Were they not holy angels? And then they sinned and they fell from grace. Can we not do the same? I would say so. And let's look at scriptures and flesh this out. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-9 And to you who are being afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels, with burning flames given punishment to those who do not know God and who do not obey the good news of of our Lord Yeshua, who will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his strength. He did not say those who do not believe the gospel of Yeshua. He said those who do not obey it. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Yeshua will be destroyed. It's right there in in the scriptures. I'm not making this up. But those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Yeshua will be destroyed. Let's look at conditions on holiness. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in attitude because of your evil deeds, but now you have been reconciled by his physical body through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you remain in the faith, established and steadfast, and not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which was proclaimed at all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. You are reconciled, holy and blameless, if, if you remain established and steadfast in faith, and not shifted away. So we see here that one can be shifted away from their holiness. It says they were reconciled. It says they were holy. It says they were blameless. And then he's warning them, if you remain and not be shifted away. Keep this in mind. Hebrews 3, 5 through 6. And Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony to the things that would be spoken. But Christ was faithful as a son of his house whose house we are, if we hold fast to the confidence and the hope we can be proud of. Christ is over us if we hold fast to our confidence and hope. It's a condition. Hebrews 3.14 For we have become partners of Christ, if indeed we hold fast the beginning of our commitment, steadfast until the end. Here again, another conditional timeline. Until the end, we must hold fast. If you haven't read this before about your walk, it's giving us conditions and these if statements. Keep that in mind. You are partners of Christ if you hold fast the commitment until the end. More conditions. 2 Peter 3.14 Therefore, dear friends, because you are waiting for these things, make every effort to be found at peace, spotless and unblemished in him. We are told here in scriptures by Peter, make every effort to be found at peace, spotless and unblemished in Yeshua. He's he's telling us we must do this. I thought we just had to believe. 2 Peter 3.17 Therefore, dear friends, because you know this beforehand, guard yourselves so that you do not lose your own safe position because you have been led away by the errors of lawless persons. We are told to guard ourselves so we do not lose our safe position. Right there, it's telling us 
we can lose our safe position and be led away by errors of the lawless. That's profound. More conditions. 2 Timothy 2.19 However, the solid foundation of God stands firm. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And everyone whose name, the name of the Lord, must abstain from unrighteousness. Everyone whose names the name of the Lord must abstain from unrighteousness. That sounds like a condition to me that is given to those who have the seal and those who are his. And if we are believers and we believe we are his, we are walking in the Lord, then we must abstain from unrighteousness. 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 5, 8. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all patience and instruction. Be self-controlled in all things. Bear hardship patiently. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is imminent. I have fought the good fight. I have completed the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have loved his appearing. Paul mentions a lot of work must be doing to keep the faith. Read that again and again, because Paul mentions a lot of work we must be doing to keep the faith. Continuing. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. I am setting before you this instruction. Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies spoken long ago about you, in order that by them you may fight the good fight, which is overcoming lawlessness, having faith and a good conscience, which some, because they have rejected these, have suffered shipwreck concerning their faith. So some people suffered shipwreck with their faith because they rejected the law. 1 Timothy 5.15 For already some have turned away and followed after Satan. When you read this in context, he's talking about those who were believers turned away and followed Satan. And I'll continue reading in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all evil, but by which some, because they desire it, have gone astray from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. So there's two verses right there talking about people turning away from their faith. So I think you may be seeing those who are believers, those who have faith, can be turned away, followed after Satan or gone astray for the desire and love of money. 1 Timothy 6, 20, 21. O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Turn away from the pointless, empty talk and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, which some, by professing it, have deviated concerning the faith. Grace be with you all. Here, some have deviated concerning the faith because of their pointless, empty talk and contradictions of what they called knowledge. So once again, some people can deviate from the faith in all of this quest for knowledge. So we must be careful and guard ourselves. 1 Peter 3.12 For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So if you look at the first part of this, his eyes are on the righteous, his ears hear their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who? Is he, who is he talking about do, do evil? I would say this is everybody, even those who are or were righteous. They do evil. His face is no longer on them. And as we've read in Deuteronomy, the blessings and curses, those who are walking in obedience, who are righteous, will experience the blessings. And those who do not will experience the curses. Yeshua's people will be zealous for good deeds. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Hallelujah training us in order that denying impiety and worldly desires, we may live self-controlled and righteously and godly in this present age. So we're training ourselves right now to be pious and not have worldly desires, to be self-controlled and righteously and godly in this present age. Looking forward to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, 
who gave himself for us in order that he might redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. Once again, these conditions are placed in scriptures and people overlook this. He is purifying his people, those who are zealous for good deeds, Literally telling us those who are zealous for good deeds, not just having faith or belief, I should say, and not acting on it. He wants those zealous for works, good deeds. Okay? I think it's pretty clear. Now let's look at faith in action. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back... My soul is not well pleased with him, but we are not among those who shrink back to destruction, but among those who have faith to the preservation of our souls. But the righteous one will live by faith. That's an action verb. Our faith must be an action. And you see here, if he shrinks back, you may fall to destruction. So people may use the term backsliding, and I think that may be fitting in here with the shrinking back being used here in scripture because we see that backsliding it warns us but we are not among those who shrink back to destruction because that's what happens to many when they start backsliding they fall back to destruction and that is not what we want to do continuing doing the word of god luke 8 21 but he answered and said to them these are my mother and my brothers which is family he's basically saying my these are my family the ones who hear the word of God and do it. Those who hear and do the word of God is Christ's family. Take that and just show that with people. (laughs) That is another evidence of being part of Christ's family are those who hear and do the word of God. Okay, faith must endure. Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has great reward, for you have need of endurance in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Why would you need endurance if you already accepted Christ or believe in him? Think about it. Why would you need endurance if you've accepted Christ or believe in him? What more do you need? That's what many mainstream teachings are teaching. But here it tells you over and over. I've been reading these scriptures, meditate upon them. For you have need of endurance, diligent service, once again, till the end. Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. But even if we are speaking in this way, dear friends, we are convinced of better things concerning you and belonging to salvation. For God is not unjust, so as to forget your work and the love which you demonstrated for his name by having served the saints and continuing to serve them, continuing to serve them. And we desire each one of you to demonstrate the same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end. I think he's pretty clear about demonstrating it and being diligent for the full assurance. This is the way we fully know by demonstrating our service in order that we may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and patience. We must demonstrate the diligent service for the full assurance of your hope until the end. You won't know until the end. And lastly here on Paul on works, Acts 26, 19 to 20. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but to those in Damascus first and in Jerusalem and all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles. I proclaimed that they should repent and turn to God, doing deeds worthy of repentance. Sounds like Paul's telling people to do much more than repent and turn to God. Paul proclaimed that they should repent and turn to God, doing deeds worthy of repentance. And that is restitution. 1 Corinthians 9.27 But I discipline my body and subjugate it. Lest somehow, after preaching to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul disciplines and subjugates himself 
so he doesn't become disqualified. Do you hear what Paul just said? He said he is disciplining his body and subjugating it so he does not become disqualified. What does that mean? Disqualified for what? Salvation? He's telling us he could become disqualified for salvation if he doesn't discipline himself and subjugate his body. Think about it. Colossians 1, 21 to 23. And although you were formerly alienated and enemies in attitude because of your evil deeds, but now you have become reconciled by his physical body through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you remain in the faith, established and steadfast and not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which by Paul became a minister. Once again, he is telling us, Paul teaches us to remain established and steadfast in faith. If you shift away, you will be an enemy of Yeshua. If you shift away, meaning that you can shift away. So people can shift away and become an enemy of Yeshua after they've been steadfast in faith, after they've been walking in faith, after they've been doing works in faith. If they become shifted away, they become an enemy of Yeshua. And what do you think that is? All right. I hope that helped. There's many other scriptures, but I, I wanted to be concise here. Now let's look into the next questions and answer these. Can believers fall away? Very interesting. What must we practice in our walk? Believers can fall away or be deceived. Hebrews 3.12 Watch out, brothers, lest there be in some of you an evil, unbelieving heart with the result that you fall away from the living God. Paul is warning that brothers in faith can fall away. That's one scripture right there alone telling us that brothers, believers, can fall away. He's warning them, if there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart. Ephesians 5, 5 through 6, written to the saints. For this you know for certain, that every sexually immoral person or unclean person or greedy person who is an idolater does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Paul is warning that brothers in faith can be deceived. Think about this. They are being deceived right now by corrupt pastors telling them that they can be idolaters and they can be greedy and be corrupt, but they are still saved. Yep. You can be sexually immoral. Yeah. Look at all the promiscuity and so forth going on. Unclean persons, whether touching a dead body would be considered mm -hmm. unclean, eating certain foods or animals like pork, etc., you would be unclean. And greedy persons, idolaters, do not have an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons of what? Disobedience. So basically what he's saying is be obedient to what? To the law. Disobedience is not following the law. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Continuing on, believers can fall away. For it is impossible concerning those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and become sharers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good work of God and the powers of the coming age and having fallen away to renew them again to repentance, have crucified again for themselves the Son of God and held him up to contempt. So Paul is warning that brothers in faith can fall away be renewed, but when they're renewed, they also have disrespected Christ. They're crucifying him again. And if one falls away from the faith and they come back, there's got to be some serious humility and restitution on that in understanding this. James 5, 19 to 20. My brothers, if anyone among you should wander away from the truth and someone turns him back, he should know that the one who turns a sinner back from the error of his ways will save that person's soul from death and will cover a great number of sins. 
James is warning that brothers in faith can wander away, but be renewed. They also have disrespected Christ too. Now, keep in mind, if we're talking about brothers in both of these verses, those believers, and they're falling away or wandering away, depending on the terms here, but they're going away from the faith, and they're talking about renewing or turning them back. Now, what happens if they died in that wandering away and fallen away state? Think about it. Because it says here, they need to be renewed or turned back from the error and it's telling us that when they're turned back from their error, that person's soul was saved from death. What we see here is that if someone is falling away or wandering away from the truth, and if they die in that state, I would not want to be them. And we'll continue. We must practice truth. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 2. And then Moses summoned all of Israel and said to them, Hear Israel, the rules and the regulations that I am speaking in your ears today and you shall learn them, and you must keep and do them. Yahweh our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. The covenant of Yahweh with Israel is to learn and keep his commandments, and that is the truth. 1 John 1, 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we practice the truth, we will have fellowship with the Father. What is truth? What are we practicing? 1 John 2, 4-5. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in this person. So right there is answer to the truth. What is the truth? Is keeping his commandments. The commandments are his truth. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in this person. But whoever keeps his word truly in this person, the love of God has been completed. Going back to the four points, belief, faith, works, and completed. That person is completed. By this, we know that we are in him. If we practice the truth, we are keeping the commandments. If we keep his word, we know we are his child. This is how we show we love him. I hope this is clear. Please meditate upon this so you fully understand it. We practice righteousness or we practice sin. 1 John 3, 4-10 Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. So there we go. Sin is lawlessness. And you know that the one was revealed in order that he might take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Everyone who resides in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as the one is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this reason, the Son of God was revealed in order to destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who is fathered by God does not practice sin. Everyone who is fathered by God does not practice sin because his seed resides in him and he is not able to sin because he has been fathered by God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are evident. Everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Namely, the one who does not love his brother. So it gives you a a nice example there. If we practice righteousness, we are not practicing sin. We are righteous. We are the children of God. Sin is lawlessness. If we practice sin, we are the child of the devil. Think about those actions. If you are a believer and you're walking in sin... You are a child of the devil. It's clear. It's right here. You can't be practicing sin and be of God. You can't. You're deceiving yourself. You're fooling yourself. And you must be walking in righteousness. You must repent if you are. You must turn away from those thoughts, those actions, whatever it may be, and do restitution. What does that mean? It means to make it right. Make it right with God, make it right with whoever, whatever, that you may be hurting or doing wrong. And no longer do it again. That's why it says, literally in verse 7, practice righteousness. 
All right, continuing. Romans 2, 12 to 16. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. For whenever the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature the things of the law, these, although they do not have the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written on their hearts. Very interesting. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts one after another, accusing or even defending them on the day when God judges the secret things of people, according to my gospel through Christ Jesus, whether not of the law or you hear the law, righteousness is only doing the law so nothing else matters if you know the law you you or you hear the law or you, or you haven't heard the law as long as you are doing the law you're righteous you may not even know what the law is but if you're doing the law doing the things that yeshua has confirmed and told us that we should be doing if you're doing these deeds of fruits of the spirit kindness gentleness joy love peace you're doing all of these things and you're doing them with a humble heart, then you're doing the law. All right, continuing. Salvation through righteousness equals work out your own salvation. We practice righteousness in humility from the heart to prove our commitment. Think about that. Philippians 2, 12 to 15. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For the one at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, is God. Do all things without grumbling and disputing in order that you may become blameless and innocent children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine as stars in the world. So we must work out our own salvation as God is working in us and we walk in obedience to be blameless and without fault. This is what the scriptures are telling us. If we believe and we repent and we have faith and we are doing works, these are things that we must do. We can't believe and follow anyone else. We are to listen to teachers, but we are to examine what we're being taught and confirm it. We are to work out our own salvation. We are accountable for our own faith, our own belief, and we must work it out. And we walk in obedience to be blameless and without fault. Okay, now I will look at this question here. Can believers be thrown into the fire? Righteousness equals doers of the law equals bearing fruit. So let's look at 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11. And I'm going to read all of this because I think it's very important. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Yeshua HaMashiach, to those who have abstained an equally precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and the Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Yeshua our Adonai, according to his divine power, has given to us all things that concern life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue, by which are given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you may be sharers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and besides this, making every effort, add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are in you and abound, they guarantee that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, but he who lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, even more, brethren, be diligent to make your calling and election secure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall 
For so an entrance shall be provided for you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. Read this over and over. It tells a lot. We must make every effort to add to our faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. If you are not doing these things, meditate on these things. Ask Yah to help you with these things. These will guarantee fruitfulness. These will guarantee fruitfulness. The scriptures tells us. If you lack these things, you are nearsighted and lacking wisdom. Continuing, we are the branches. Can We, the branches, can be broken off or cut down. Interesting. Romans 11, 17 to 21. Now, if some of the branches were broken off and you, although you were a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and became a sharer of the root of the olive tree's richness, do not boast against the branches. But if you boast against them, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off in order that I could be grafted in. They were broken off because of unbelief. But you stand firm because of faith. Do not think arrogant thoughts, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. If those natural branches were broken off because of unbelief, you better believe it that if you have unbelief, you will be broken off too. So here's another scripture that is clear that those who have belief can lose their faith, their belief. Here Paul is speaking to Gentiles, non-Jews, in an analogy of a holy olive tree where Gentiles standing firm in faith are branches that are grafted into this tree. They now are branches of Israel. Even the current branches can be broken off due to unbelief. This analogy is telling us that the faith full believer can lose their connection with the Father due to unbelief. Continuing, continuing, John 15, 4 to 10. Remain in me and I in you, just as the branch is not able to bear fruit from itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him, this one bears much fruit. For apart from me, you are not able to do anything. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this. Remember that? My father is glorified by this. Salvation comes from the Father for what purpose? For his glory. That you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Remain. There's another condition. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Now he's telling us how to remain in his love. By keeping his commandments. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. If we are to follow Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua is telling us, If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. Just as Yeshua is keeping the Father's commandments, remains in His love. Okay? If you do not keep His commandments, you will, will not remain in His love. And you will be thrown into the fire. A believer can be thrown into the fire if he does not keep His commandments. And goes to unbelief. We, the branches, can be broken off or cut down. Matthew 7, 18 and 20. A good tree is not able to produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree to produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown, where? Into the fire. As a result, you will recognize them by their fruits. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will what? You will keep my commandments. Luke 22, 31 or 32. Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Very interesting. Luke 8, 13, Parable of the Seeds. And those on the rock are those who receive the word with joy when they hear it. And these do not have enough root who believe for a time and in a time of testing fall away. You must keep your belief, faith, and works or we will fail. And we must keep it for how long? until the end consuming fire for those who sin deliberately 
after receiving Christ. Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. For if we keep on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that is about to consume the adversaries. It is clear that if a believer keeps sinning deliberately, there is no salvation but consuming fire. 1 Timothy 5.8 But if someone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Think about that one. What can separate us from the love of God? Romans 8.1-4 there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who walk according to the Spirit have no condemnation. So what is the saying? Those who walk in the law of the Spirit of life are made free from the law of sin and death. God's Son came to show that a man can live sinless unto death who can now condemn sin itself. Those who walk according to the Spirit is fulfilling the righteousness of the law. Romans 8, 5 through 8. For those who are under the influence of the flesh mind, the things of the flesh. But those who are under the influence of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not one of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. The carnal mind and friendship with this world is an enemy of God and cannot please him. We cannot have a carnal mind and we cannot have friends with this world or friendship with this world. If Christ is in you, your body, flesh, and carnal mind are dead from sin. But your spirit is life because of what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? If you don't understand what righteousness is, it's doing what Yeshua commands. We read that and given examples. James 4.4, 4, adulterous people, do you not know the friendship with this world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Okay. Can you be punished after you were forgiven? Let's read the parable of the unforgiving servant. Matthew 18, 25-35. And because he did not have enough to repay it, the master ordered him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and everything that he had, and to be repaid. Then the slave threw himself to the ground and began to do obeisance to him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything to you. So the master of the slave, because he had compassion, released him and forgave him his loan. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and taking hold of him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay back everything that you owe me. Then his fellow slave threw himself to the ground and began to implore him, saying, Be patient with me, and I will repay you. But he did not want to, but rather he went and threw him into prison until he would repay what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were extremely distressed. And they went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then his master summoned him and said to him, Wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you implored me. Should you not also have shown mercy to your fellow slave as I have showed mercy to you? And he was angry. His master handed him over to the merciless jailers until he would repay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless each of you forgives his brothers from your hearts. 
So those who are forgiven a debt and do not do the same to others are wicked. And the punishment that was removed will be returned without mercy. So this slave, this servant, because he did not show mercy as he was shown mercy, he was now called back and he was sent to the merciless jailers. Okay, he was already forgiven his debt. But now, since he cannot show the same mercy to others, he is now being called back and being handed over to the merciless jailers that he would repay everything that was owed. This is talking about him being sold, his wife being sold, his children being sold, everything that he had being sold, and they had to be slaves to someone else and to work it off to pay this guy back. So everything that he was forgiven is now being put back on him as a punishment for not showing the same mercy that was shown to him. And we see in verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless each of you forgives his brothers from your hearts. So this example is an example we must be really careful with. If you're asking for forgiveness from the Father and you can't forgive others as the Father's forgiven you, you are going to suffer the consequences that you thought that the Father forgave you. Because if you can't forgive someone else after you've asked the Father for forgiveness, then he is still going to punish you because you could not do the same to to your brother. Think about that. Matthew 7.12 Therefore, in all things, whatever you want that people should do to you, thus also you do to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's what it boils down to. Do unto others as you want them to do it to you. Matthew 6, 14, 15. For if you forgive people their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people, neither will your Father forgive your sins. That basically wraps up what the parable of the servant said. James 2 13, For judgment is merciless to the one who has not practiced mercy. Once again, we saw that happen in the uh, parable. Matthew 5 7, Blessed are the merciful because they will be shown mercy. Judgment comes based on your actions. We must become overcomers, but how do we become overcomers? We are overcomers if we believe in Christ and keep God's commands. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are conquerors through Christ and shall not be separated from the love of God. But what did we conquer? The flesh and carnal mind. We now have the spirit of life By belief in Christ and keeping God's commandments, we are overcomers. We conquered. We are overcomers. 1 John 5, 1-5 Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the children born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this, if we love God and we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believes that Yeshua is the Son of God. John 3, 15-21 So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For in this way, God loved the world so that he gave his one and only son in order that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world in order that he should judge the world, but in order that the world should be saved through him. 
The one who believes in him is not judged, but the one who does not believe has already been judged, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil, based on their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light, in order that his deeds may be revealed that they are done in God. John 5, 28-29 Do not be astonished at this, because an hour is coming in which all those in the tombs will hear his voice, and they will come out, those who have done good things, to a resurrection of life. But those who have practiced evil things to a resurrection of judgment. Please read that again. Talking about those that are going to be resurrected. To life are the ones who've done good things. Okay? <laughs> Think about it. Both people, whether in light or darkness, deeds will be revealed. The one who believes and practices the truth comes to the light and is not judged because his deeds are done in God. Why would someone not be judged? Because they are practicing righteousness. They're practicing truth. They aren't doing anything evil, so they can't be judged. The one who practices evil love the darkness and hate the light. That one is already judged because he does not believe in the Son. All right, so let's talk about preparing for action and your lamps burning. Let's talk about the parable of the ten virgins. Pure and beaten olive oil is necessary. So let's prepare for action. Matthew 25, 1-13 Then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take olive oil with them. But the wise ones took olive oil in flasks with their lamps. And when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But in the middle of the night there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise ones, Give us some of your olive oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise ones answered, saying, Certainly there will never be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell olive oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they had gone away to buy it, the bridegroom arrived, and those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding celebration, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open the door for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore be on the alert, because you do not know the day nor the hour. Exodus 27 20 and you will command the israelites and they will bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually how did they cause this lamp to burn continually they had to bring pure beaten olive oil so the olives must be crushed beaten and filtered to be purified right so let's continue reading luke 12 35 to 36. You must be prepared for action and your lamps burning and you be like people who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that when he comes back and knocks, they can open the door for him immediately. So to be prepared for action, we must have our lamps burning, right? And what did the wise ones do? They had the flask of oil with them. And what is the oil? It's pure, it's beaten olive oil with them. Zephaniah 1.12 I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the uncommitted. You can read that verse, and it's basically talking about the uncommitted was being searched out that are going to get punished, right? And we can look at the unwise virgins as the ones who may have not been committed because they didn't have the extra olive oil. 1 Corinthians 6.20 for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Okay? If you were bought with a price and your master instructs you to live righteously, you will do so in obedience, proving your loyalty and love to your master. Will you not? Will you not? If you know you've been bought with a price, because it says it here, and your master instructs you to live righteously, will you not do so to prove your love? 
You produce pure oil only when the fruit, the olive, is beaten, crushed, and filtered. So, in getting the oil itself, we must produce fruit. When we read the parables of the fruit, we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. So we must walk in those. And to get the olive oil, we're going to be beaten, we're going to be crushed, and it's all going to be purified. We see many analogies of this, whether it's talking about purifying metal, pulling off the dross, purifying it multiple times, etc. Because the Father wants a pure, righteous people. And to have that, we must endure to the end. We must be continually walking in faith, and that's showing our works in producing that oil and remaining faithful until the end through all of the hardships and all of the tests and trials. That is where we're getting and producing our oil and having it so our lamps continually to burn and walk in righteousness as a light in this world. And lastly here on the olive oil, Matthew 25, 9, go instead to those who sell olive oil and buy or redeem, that word is redeem, some for yourselves. Okay, now going off of this verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. How did Yeshua redeem us? Think about how he redeemed us. He had to go through and live what? A sinless life. So if we want to buy olive oil, if we want to redeem some for ourselves, what must we do? We must be and do what Yeshua did. Yeshua tells us to follow him. Yeshua tells us to do what he does. So we are to walk in righteousness. This is how we get our oil with this analogy. Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The Father provided salvation for us so that he may be glorified, right? And we read right here, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father. Remember, Yeshua telling the people to examine his works in the Father, whether or not to believe him. Remember that? We are called to bear fruit of the Spirit. You produce pure oil only when the fruit is beaten, crushed, and filtered. And I will end with this. Our expectation is to bear fruit. We should be walking in His Word, bearing fruits of the Spirit, and enduring to the end, seeking His face. This way we have the pure oil and extra always with us to the end. And we read Galatians, 1 Timothy, Philippians, what that fruit is. Love, peace, patience, joy, kindness, goodness, humility, self-control, fidelity, and that's faith, fidelity, edification, piety, and forgiveness. And in 1 John, we see this in 5.18 and also in 3, 6 through 9. We know that everyone having been born of Elohim does not sin. But the one having been born of Elohim guards himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Remember this. If you're guarding yourself, you're guarding your ways, and you're walking in Yeshua, in righteousness, the wicked one cannot touch you. So I hope this is a blessing unto you. I hope this is encouraging. I hope this answers some questions that you may have had or sends you to explore deeper and further into the subject of salvation and confirm what I shared and see where it takes you. I pray that this blesses you and blesses all that you do in your walk with Yeshua. I pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, first of all, thank you. It was such an amazing uh, presentation. You put everything together. Really good job. I had a few thoughts. Let's Can I it. share them? Please. Okay. So just the thought that came to me on this slide, in Hebrew, the words for faithfulness, belief, and loyalty mm -hmm. share the same root. Mm. So it's basically the same words. Okay. So loyalty, 
Nice. Okay. I had three scriptures that came to mind. First one is Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. And I was thinking when Yeshua went into a very long sermon here and he kept saying, you have heard that. Remember, he kept mm -hmm. saying it. So he said, you have heard that it was said to the people of all, do not commit murder, and whoever commits murder will be subject to judgment. And then he goes on and says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and so on. And he, he keeps talking about the different sins. So I thought about it when he said it, you have heard that it was said, do not do this or that. He never said, but no worries. Now that you believe in me, you are saved. Don't even worry about it. Forget all of these things. On the contrary, he actually beefed up <laughs> those laws and explained that they are way beyond physical or mechanical. External. They are also External. to do with your thoughts and emotions. Thought about it and I think the way he constructed that ceremony shows that <laughs> there is no such thing as salvation in spite of your actions. Okay. I think when Yeshua was talking about, you heard it said, you, know, you shouldn't murder someone, but if you fought in your heart, then you committed a murder. I'm paraphrasing. But that goes back to the heart issue. And that's why when it comes to your actions, if you're doing the deeds of the law, but you aren't doing it from the heart, you aren't doing them. And, yeah. and, and so that's the point is your heart, yeah. if your thoughts are to murder someone, then you committed murder. Mm -hmm. But if your thoughts are, I want to please the Father in doing these things, then you are doing things of righteousness. You are doing the right ways because it's mm -hmm. from your heart in that way. But if you're doing these things of the law because Scripture says to do it, I'm going to do it, but your heart isn't in it at all then you aren't doing it. But beyond it, my point is that he wouldn't even go into that ceremony if the moment you believe in him yourself, then you can do whatever you want. No, I agree. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally got that and agree with that. Yeah. I just wanted to touch mm -hmm. on that topic as, mm -hmm. because it all goes down to the heart. Okay, the second thought that I have was about um, Deuteronomy chapter 13. And I want to take the time and read it and then share my thoughts about it. It says, If a prophet stands up in your midst, or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives to you a sign or wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes about that he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods and let us serve them. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or to that dreamer. For Yahweh your God is testing you to know whether you love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your inner self. You shall go after Yahweh your God and him you shall revere and his commandment you shall keep and to his voice you shall listen and him you shall serve and to him you shall hold fast. And then it continues. I'll skip a few verses and then it says... If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife, whom you impress, or your intimate friend in secrecy says, Let us go and let us serve other gods that you and your ancestors have not known, but you shall certainly kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to kill him, and next the hand of all of the people, and you shall stone him with stones and let him die blah, blah, blah. If you hear in one of your towns, which Yahweh your God is giving you to live in, someone saying that worthless men have gone out from your midst and have seduced the inhabitants of their town, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom you have not known, then you shall inquire or examine. Anyway, why am I even bringing this chapter up? I think this chapter is a key to our understanding. There are two options here. Either Yeshua taught us that it's okay to forsake Yah's law, or he didn't teach us. 
if Yeshua actually taught us to forsake, that it's okay to forsake Yah's law, then Yeshua qualifies under chapter 13 mm-hmm. to be executed. And the Pharisees were correct executing him. But we know that Yeshua didn't teach <laughs> to forsake the commandments. On the contrary, he insisted that's our gateway. We need to follow the law. He did not come to replace the law. He insisted on that then we know that it does not fit the profile of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13. So I feel that when mainstream Christianity keeps pushing it that Yeshua replaced the law, they are actually putting Yeshua under the liability of Deuteronomy chapter 13 and they are justifying what the Pharisees did. So I hope I made it clear and I hope I didn't offend anyone by saying it. I'm just trying to drive a point that Yeshua definitely (laughs) didn't fit the profile of that false prophet, that dreamer that Yahweh was referring to in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And then the last thought that I had that I wanted to share Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 12 through 16. So you, son of man, say to your people that the righteousness of the righteous shall not save him in the day of his transgression, and the wickedness of the wicked will not cause him to stumble on the day of his returning from his wickedness. And the righteous will not be able to live by it on the day when he returns to his sin. When I say to the righteous, certainly he will live, and he trusted in his righteousness, and he turns and he does injustice, all of his righteousness will not be remembered. All of his righteousness will not be remembered. And because of his injustice that he did, because of it, he will die. And when I say to the wicked, certainly you will die, but he returns from his sin and he does justice and righteousness. For example, the wicked returns a pledge for a loan. He restores stolen property. He goes in the statutes of life so as not to do injustice. Certainly he will live. He will not die. All of his sins that he committed, they will not be remembered against him. And he did justice and righteousness. Certainly he will live. I think this summarizes everything Yah is telling us. Righteous, when a righteous sins, all of his righteousness is not going to save him. And when a wicked person repents, all of his evil deeds are forgiven and forgotten. And I got one more thing to share if you're done. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. One last thing I wanted to talk about the challenges that believers may have once they come to belief, repentance, and faith. And they are walking out that faith and doing works, etc. Once that initial point starts, many people struggle. And I think there's some verses here in Sirach 4, 11, 16 to 19 that may help us understand. It says, Wisdom will exalt her sons and lay hold to those who seek her. If he has faith, he will inherit her and his descendants will be in possession of her, because at first she will travel with him. Though he twist and turn, fear and dread she will bring upon him, and she will torment him with her training until she has faith in his soul, and she will test him with her statutes. And again, she will return straight back to him, and will make him glad, and will reveal to him her secrets. And if he goes astray, she will abandon him and hand him over to the grip of his fall. So I think this is very telling that when we come to faith and the spirit dwells within us, 
And as some of you may know, when we, when we speak about wisdom is a spirit, and that spirit is related to the Ruach, HaKodesh, whether it is exactly her or not, it's related to it. In this sense, from Sirach, if wisdom comes within us once we are walking in faith, it tests us. The spirit tests us. And that is what we are going through. And here it mentions her training. So we're being tested and trained in our faith. If we have the faith, she will test with her statutes. So we are being tested according to the law because her statutes are the commands. And if we remain righteous, then she remains with us. But it says if we go astray, she will abandon us and hand us over to the grip of your fall. So I think that's very telling that the Spirit is testing us. When we come to faith, we're being tested, we're being trained, and walking out this walk in righteousness so that we can remain in our faith, doing works until the end, so that we can be in the family of Yah. With that, I want to thank you all, and I pray that everyone will go and do their own research in what was shared, and may it inspire you to confirm and understand and know your faith, and have that faith be secure and endure to the end. Blessings to you all. Thank you. Thank you.